Welcome to Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Bobby Pominville and I'm your arts reporter. Today I have invited two artists to the show and oh, I'm so excited about this interview. But I must tell you, they are now exhibiting at the FIP Center for the Arts. And that's a place I often visit and I get a lot of inspiration from the galleries. So the name of the exhibit is In This Place, what makes a place holy? And it starts October 27th and it runs through December 3rd. You really should go to this exhibit. I think you would enjoy it. Here's a little bit of a description. In this place is a multifaceted ex exhibition exploring the question, what makes a place holy? Its focus is on the lands of the Quran the Torah and the Bible, from ancient times to the present, and on the multiplicity of ways people experience these places as holy. The artists come from three religious traditions. Today we have two of the artists with us. Hend Al-Mansur is Muslim. Welcome to the show, Hend. I'm delighted Thank to you. have you. And Susan Armington is Christian. Welcome, Thank Susan. You very much. Yeah. Oh, this is going to be one of my favorite interviews, I can tell you already. I have looked at a little bit of their artwork, and there's more going on besides that, but let's get to the artwork. Uh, Susan, I'm going to start with you today. I have a beautiful quote from you Like an archaeological tell, made from layers of civilizations in one place, I build up the painting surface with old writings and texts, handmade papers, textured pastes and brushwork to suggest wind, movement, shadows, depth, and the passage of time. And we will be showing you her artwork while she talks about it. So will you please tell us about that beautiful piece of artwork you brought? Oh, thank you. Um, I'd be glad to. So the name of that piece is The Waters of Babylon. And the water going through is the ancient Tigris-Euphrates. There are two different rivers by Babylon. So what I'm representing is that river. And then if you look really closely in the painting, you can see underneath there's little residues of the ancient civilizations. I think I'm going to turn and point to some. These are some drawings and little bits of um, archaeology of even what is there now from the ancient civilizations over here as well. And then in and amongst the land, there's little bits of ancient writings. These happen to be from the Rosetta Stone, but there's also um, other little tiny bits of writing from ancient times in this area. But it also refers to the present day Iraq, which is where this is the same site as the ancient site. That is just astounding. And the way you built that up through textures, um, I, I first, when I looked, I couldn't see that, of course, on the brochure, but now I'm looking at the real artwork, and I'm sure people will notice that when we're talking about it. And then, is that a boat? That's a boat. Yeah, it's a shipwreck. Oh, okay. I and I, I took a um, particular shipwreck that is quite famous that I'll tell you in a moment. But it's a shipwreck, and I collaged on top of it um, sites in the U.S. so that it now mm -hmm. seems to represent something American. And the shipwreck is actually the Titanic as it is on the bottom of the ocean oh, floor. Yes. So it's kind of an intervention into this scene. The scene of Babylon and Tigris and Euphrates is this disastrous wreck that comes right down in there. And I'm referring both to ancient times. Of course, the, sh the Titanic wasn't around then, but the idea of disaster and ruin. Mm -hmm. And then the time, uh, the present time now, where um, I refer to like the invasion of Iraq. And mm -hmm. so I'm getting the feeling of that. But even though you can see it as an intervention that comes into the picture, I feel that the movement of the water 
is like the life force that continues on behind it. And that's, that's what I want to refer to. Um, in the ancient kind of biblical text in the Torah, there's the waters of Babylon. Uh, by the waters of Babylon, I lay down and, or we lay down and wept and wept for thee, Zion. And those words were um, spoken in exile by Jews who were exiled after the second temple. So I feel too that sense of ruin and disaster and yearning also goes with the current situation in the picture. That's what I think. I have to compliment you. It's, it's so astounding. It looks like the water is actually moving. Mm -hmm. And I just, the, the record course drew me, but those other pieces are so neat too. Thank you. Thank I'm you. really into this type of history. So I just, you've just really spoken to me and I know people are just going to enjoy that so, so much. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And let's talk about your way of expressing yourself through art. I would like to share another quote I heard from you. My work addresses gender inequality and sexual discrimination, childhood's memories, and my reservoir of images and stories, longings, secrets, and desires of women in my hometown in Arabia provide me with endless inspiration. That is beautiful. Will you please talk to us about your piece of art back there? Um, thank you very much. You are welcome. This piece is called um, She Thinks She Makes Art. And um, it is um, a combination of uh, henna design on the border um, and geometric Islamic design in the center. And uh, uh, there's a double self-portrait that kind of like fighting together or fencing yes. with brush, with a brush. And it's reflected uh, on the lower side of the, so it's like a mandala. And um, it's also like a circle that I ran into or within where I kind of struggle with um, myself as an artist. Uh, my self-worth as an artist, is my art good enough? Um, mm. uh, am I an artist or not? Or just making beautiful things, you know? So that is the meaning of this. You're a very deep thinker. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, I didn't recognize this before, but that does look like you. Yes. <laughs> now that you explained it, I certainly can recognize you. And those patterns you were talking about, I've heard about that when I've studied on the History Channel. Those different designs uh, show up in different areas of the world. Mm. And specifically from the area you're used to, probably, mm -hmm. Arabia. Yes. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And it's, it's beautiful, the colors. Yes, and that's another thing about, uh, about making art for me. Because um, uh, when I was there in Saudi Arabia, I made art that is uh, more of a Western style art. Oh. That, um, influenced by, you know, Western art a lot. Yes. yes, of course. As many of the artists in the area. Actually, that's how the art is taught there and here. And, and when I came to art school here, I realized that, that, um, you know, my heritage, my artistic um, language is not used as a contemporary art. It's used as a historical oh, art. Oh, yes. And as just pretty uh, craft or something like that. So I, I, that's what motivated me to change into this style of really vibrant colors and um, um, a, a lot of geometric design and oh, yes. uh, flowery design, henna design. It's very mm -hmm. attractive. And it's a screen printing also. It's a screen oh, print, yeah. That's lovely. Wow. Now, I didn't give you this question, but I just have to ask you gals. Uh, Susan, I just want to know, as a child, how were you inspired by art, or how were oh. you inspired to make art? 
Any, anything in particular that really led you to this world, this beautiful art? I just art loved art. I, in all my free time, I drew and colored, and I loved fabrics, and I loved design, and I loved wearing things and dress up, and, uh, and I made things all the time. I, made, I had a dollhouse, and I made little things for the dollhouse, and I made, we just, in my household, we just made things. Even my brothers, we all played together and made things. Um, we made mazes for our hamsters oh my. out of blocks, like a maze. And then we put lettuce at the end as <laughs> a, you know, the reward. <laughs> and we put little playing cards on top. Oh and we would lift up the cards to see where the hamster was. And finally, it got to the end. So I was so used to doing things with my hands that when I got older, I painted. And I think by high school, I didn't learn in school, but a friend of mine told me about oil painting. So I bought a particular set of paint she told me to buy, and I started painting, and I just loved it. Uh, but in my family, it wasn't important. So I had the freedom to do it, but mm -hmm. it wasn't considered an important thing. So I did really serious studying, and I went to school uh, for literature, and I studied graduate work in linguistics because those in my mind were the f important things and it's just I feel like a really lucky accident that things shifted around and I'm able to do what is really my passion and my natural way of expressing myself as the work that I do in my life. Oh that's that's a great answer. Mm -hmm. You really totally explained how you got into it. Mm -hmm. Now I'm gonna go to hand and I'm gonna ask you. I assume you probably had a whole different place of growing up, mm -hmm. something we're not familiar with. And we just I just wanted to know if there's something that inspired you there. Oh yeah. Um, um I also made art all, all my childhood and I was inspired by my mother. Mm -hmm. She was the first person I saw making drawings and paintings. And um, she also taught me that uh, women are equal to men and girls are important, as important as boys. And she wanted me to go to school and to college and to be, um, you know, educated woman, which is not really the um, aspiration of all Saudi women at that time. Right. Yeah. Sure. Um, she herself wanted to study and she couldn't when she was a child, but she did study when she grew up later. Oh, that's yes. Good. Um, and I, when I grew up, I had, um, because uh, of this um, segregation um, practice in Saudi Arabia, right. I grew up among wo women uh, of all kinds of life. Uh, they socialized together like in, um, in a house where there would be neighbors and there would be Bedouin coming from the desert and there would be family and a lot of children. So we, there's a lot of women that I hear their stories, and um, that's what I was referring to. That um, each woman have certain, you know, personality that uh, yes. inspires me. Very much so. And oh, you're touching on some issues here that are very current that are important to me too, through your art. So thank you for that too. And oh, I can't wait to see the whole exhibit. It's going to be so wonderful. Now, I do want to tell the audience about a couple things because there's a lot of things going on along with this exhibit. Um, there will be an open house on October 29th, Sunday, if you would like to meet the artists. And you're going to enjoy some music by an Egyptian violinist and a vocalist. And this really speaks to me. I hope to be there and see you to again and then hear the music. Then there's um, a lecture, Sacred Spaces in Judaism, Christianity and Islam by David Penchansky. I apologize if I didn't say his name right. <laughs> That's November 7th at 7 and it's at the Hudson United Methodist Church. Um, I'm very familiar with that. It's free and open to the public. He's my husband, by the way. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I didn't know that. 
So do you want to talk a little bit about that? How would he, I mean, he must be a well-studied man to be talking about all this. He's a, yeah, professor at St. He Thomas. He is a professor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. That's and the uh, one Susan that I, is the one who suggested him. Oh, I'm a fan <laughs> of that professor. I haven't taken his classes, but I've heard him talk often. And he knows so much. And he oh. also speaks Arabic and has oh been to Saudi my. Arabia. So he's really well-versed. Oh, um, and he teaches, special. doesn't he teach Old Testament yes, at St. Thomas? Them. So we recommend the lecture very strongly. Oh my goodness, that really inspires me when I hear you two talking like that. <laughs> and, and what a, a beautiful thing that he's so connected to you, your husband. And then it's, it's like a whole nother thing. It's a piece of literature. It's, it's, we can learn so much from him because he understands so much. Mm -hmm. And actually, there was a brochure, you know, that uh, the Phipps published that I got from Anastasia. And I want to thank her as well because she has really helped me to find you two great artists. And uh, I read that and I saw that name and I didn't think a thing of it. <laughs> so how wonderful for you two to be so connected. Oh, I'm glad you told me that. Okay, then on November 9th, there's a community forum called Different Voices, Shared Visions. There would be some docent-led tours prior to the forum, and that's the Phipps Black Box Theater. And I know a few of these names, but not all of them. There's panelists. I think it would be very interesting, and I'm happy to say that our cable channel, the River Channel here in Hudson, where we're sitting, will be filming that. Wish they were filming the lecture too. Oh, and then there's a music performance by the Rose Ensemble. I've heard of them. November 25th at 7.30 p.m. and I'll be up in the light booth. I'm I going just to want to put them. in a plug for them. Yes, they please do. An exceptionally wonderful musical group. I've heard them over the years and they're doing a program, I believe, of interfaith. So music from diff three different traditions. Yes. And they're exceptionally wonderful, and it's a special thing that they'll be in Hudson. I so know, and I think it's, we're just so lucky to have them. And so the connections with this exhibit, we don't always get everything besides the art. I mean, sometimes we go and look at the art, and there's, there's really no way to talk about it or to hear about it or to even hear music from these different areas of the world. And I think this is so well planned. And I do think it's just wonderful for you, you girls, to be in it. Thank you. Thanks. Now, there's one thing he wrote about. I can ask this now because I know Hen knows about this. He <laughs> talked to this question of what makes a place holy. And he explained so many things that happened in the Middle East and different places that how they consider their land holy. And it even goes to where um, the Jewish people wanted to stand on land from their country when they prayed. And sometimes it was sacrificing and that too. But that was shocking to me. And then I found out that they, I knew they turned a certain way during prayer, but I had no idea it was toward the place that was destroyed that used to be Solomon's temple. And then there was another reference he made um, to the, uh, oh, different faiths. He was telling about different faiths and how they face, oh, I've forgotten the name of the building. It's a square cube. Oh, the Mecca. Mecca. The Mecca. Mm -hmm. I am so sorry. Yes, thank you for <laughs> helping me. And, and I didn't realize that you know, this was so important to people from that area. But then he said something about when you go to see the artwork, each one of you have created a space, a sacred space with your artwork. And the way he explained that to me was just astounding. Because when we would go to view one of your pieces of art, we're actually in somewhat of a holy place. So to me, that just touched me. Because now after you explained your artwork to me, and I know there's many other pieces, 
But isn't that a wonderful way to look at it? To be in the FIPS looking at each one of your artwork pieces and how, you know, I'm going to be, be sure I tell everybody about this <laughs> and spread the word. But I just thought that was a beautiful way to express how important your artwork is and how much it means to you because you developed it. You're the ones that it came from you. And I just think that's absolutely so astounding to me. Mm. I've never thought of art that way. Isn't it a beautiful thing? I think we developed it, but it's an invitation for the viewer to step inside that same kind of energy, yes. that kind of sacredness. Exactly. And meditate on that. Yes. yes. So each. we're really going a step farther than just looking at art, to me. Yeah. We're making it part of ourselves. Yeah. So that was your husband. Uh, he is. <laughs> he is really uh, amazing with words. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's on the brochure too. That's why we recommend that lecture. I understand totally like now why evening. you do that. That's going to be really, really good. And um, Methodist Church is not very far from here, you know. Mm. We're all in the, pretty much in the same. It's not very far from the Phipps to get to that church. I've been there many times. So we definitely have to consider that. Well, ladies, this has been a joy for me. Thank you. I got Thank you so much, much out of your explanations and your, I can't wait to go to the exhibit now. Well, we look forward to okay. seeing you. So I thank you so, so much for coming today. I know you have busy schedules mm -hmm. and I just appreciate it so, so much. And I hope you as the audience enjoyed this talk about artwork and we'll get um, I hope you have some time to come down to the FIPS and view it and thank you for watching I'm Susan Arlington I'm an artist who works in mixed media that means I use a lot of different kinds of materials putting them together in one canvas or one three-dimensional piece of art I usually start with a loose sketch of a map of a particular um, place and I often lay down a, a layer or two of paint to give some underlying color and then I infuse the map with layers of textures and handmade papers and and ancient writings and text and then I start to collage on top with handmade papers with writings like I'll build something in collage and then start painting over it and then collage into it, and then add a little bit of writing. I love maps. I love maps that have writing on them and that also have the shape of land and the idea of an overhead view as if you're floating over the land and looking down on it. I make this kind of art because I'm exploring things that I can't really figure out how to explore any other way. After a while, I stand back and I look at the whole piece and I see what feeling I get from it at that point. And if there's a different place that it needs to go, then I start exploring that with drawing. And so I'm working on a kind of map of the whole area, but here's the Red Sea. So my work is often inspired by a particular region, like a particular land or landscape in the Middle East, often a place that something spiritual has happened. And this is the path of Moses. It's like I'm trying to make a landscape for the feelings and questions I have, a landscape that can hold that, that dimension, which isn't obvious in everyday life. And it's as if kind of the contemporary layering of the geography is on top, and then in the center you're going back, you're going into the depths, you're going into more ancient kind of um, image that crosses time and space. So this is a painting that I'm still working on, 
and the inspiration is the birthplace of John the Baptist. And what I loved about the original image is the idea of a dome, but it kind of looks like it's earth that has become sky. My art represents um, ways of exploring deep interior places, questions I have, a sense of spirituality and spiritual forces that I don't know how else to represent it. This piece is a mixed media painting and it's called Our Lady of the Lenora. I think I'm inspired by my upbringing as a child where spirituality, spiritual issues, were always framed in the language and images of the Bible and the Holy Land. And the gesture in my mind relates to the lighting of the candles for Shabbat. And down by her feet, there's a menorah, which has since ancient times been a symbol of Judaism. I'm kind of just looking for this landscape to give it shape and feeling and meaning. And the answers aren't straightforward. The answers aren't something that you can just say in a paragraph. The work is the work. It's hard to talk about it and what it represents or means. My name is Hind Al-Mansur. I am an immigrant from Saudi Arabia. I do screen printing and installation. My art advocates gender justice, women's power, and sexual independence. I have a passion for Islamic art motifs and composition, like geometric design, henna patterns, sado patterns, which is a local art in Saudi Arabia, Arabic calligraphy and Islamic architecture. I usually arrange my image within a decorated border, which is inspired by um, Quran page layout and Arabic illuminated manuscripts. So my work is a hybrid of ancient and new. What I really find myself in is making the line. It is the ultimate medium that can release and disentangle the trapped emotions and ideas. I first draw an image with a pencil, then scan it and modify it on the computer. I clean it up, multiply a pattern, or change its size. I then fill in colors and separate each color into an image layer by itself. Then I burn each layer onto a silk screen. Growing up in Saudi Arabia, I have witnessed firsthand what it means to live in a patriarchal world. I like screen printing, and it was easy for me to be good at it. The rituals also give me the satisfaction of labor and of achievement. It can lend itself to historical art and to repetition, like a pattern. It gives a feeling of perfectness and sublimity. There is also an element of unpredictability. It makes me feel that some other cosmic power is incorporated in its making. When I want to make an installation, I print on rolls of paper or fabric. With an underlying wooden or cardboard structure, I use those prints in building walls and ceilings, arches and columns, and make an enclosed space with gates and corridors and courtyards and rooms. Art making is a way to be visible, not only to the outside world, but also to myself. Art making helps me understand myself.
People often ask the artists to explain their work. In fact, the viewer might be able to understand the work better than the maker. I once uh, heard this writer say uh, to her audience that all ideas in her book, everything they need to know, is right there in the book. She, the writer, is a mere distraction. Making art makes you exposed, really, because even if you want to hide things, art betrays your secrets. In a way, art making is like remembering a dream. My name is Sylvia Horowitz. I am primarily a photographer, uh, working with digital and in a very traditional way with film and darkroom technique. Photography has been a way for me to connect with other people, to visit other places and uh, experience the, the, the history and the strength that I derive from the uh, from the natural world, but it's a natural world that has biblical significance or where something has occurred that is um, infused with strength and humanity and, uh, and something really bigger than anything that I bring to it. I came to photography at a time when I was uh, really dealing with some deep uh, personal loss, irrevocable loss. And uh, the question that I had was how do people find the strength and the resilience to go on in their lives with meaning, with purpose, with, with joy? Um, the places that I was drawn to were places where people had a history well, the first place was uh, the powwows in northern Minnesota and the Native American experience. Other places and other people that I've dealt with have been in the Middle East, in, in Israel, as you see from my work, in Argentina with the mothers of the disappeared who have had to uh, go on and find meaning and find a direction after um, the loss of their children. This is a boy who I didn't uh, speak to, but he spoke to me with his gaze uh, as he looked in the camera, like, what are you doing here in, in my place, in my neighborhood? Where there, uh, this girl on the men's part of the wall, the western wall, lifting this chain link fence over her head, these constraints we're not going to stop her and this image became emblematic for me for breaking out of some of the things that held me back this is the enlarger this is my baby the negative fit into the enlarger and light is projected through the negative and onto the paper. This is the timer that measures just uh, tenths of seconds. In the dark room, I'm concerned about small, small increments of time, but I do lose track of hours. The dark room is a very solitary, meditative process. It's labor intensive. It's not just creative, but it's also spiritual. Dark room is all about dark and light and, uh, and discovery. A bird hit the window in our studio space. And I, I gathered up the bird that was stunned at first and then died. Uh, I, I immediately uh, felt like a custodian for this bird. And I wanted to understand how birds get disoriented. As I went around the camp with my camera and took a bird's eye view of windows and the reflection of the landscape and the water, um, I could see this disorientation. 
And this immediately became a metaphor for the refugees who think that they are going to a safer place and dying en route. Do we even think about how many refugees die en route? Every element of photography for me, from the beginning of um, making the image all the way through, is an invitation for me to access something in myself and in out, and out there in the great mystery of the universe that I can't, uh, I, I find it difficult to express this because it is deeply personal and um, it's in the realm of things that are difficult to articulate.